welcome everyone. We will give it a few more minutes as people join the room. I can see more people coming in. Um, my name is Elizabeth Griffiths. I'm Assistant Director of Public Health here at Birmingham City Council. Um, and today I think is our sixth nutrition and health um, seminar that Basuda has coordinated. Um, the focus of today's session is perinatal health and diet. Um, and I will hand over to Basuda to introduce our speakers. Many thanks for your time. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for the welcome. I'll just put my slides on. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today uh, on today's webinar, um, Diet and Perinatal Health. We have got Hannah Jones. Uh, she's a senior community uh, dietitian uh, and Yadava Jeve, consultant reproductive medicine, uh, who are going to talk on uh, diet and fertility, um, programming future generations, and uh, diet in pregnancy. Uh, just some housekeeping rules for today. Uh, please stay muted and turn off your camera during this webinar and uh, use the chat function at the end of each uh, each presentation will uh, answer the questions on the on the on the presentation um, and uh, um, this webinar is going to be recorded and it will be shared on uh, youtube uh, channel healthy brahm youtube channel for for people who couldn't attend today and uh, uh, so I wanted to uh, talk about feedback. At the end of the webinar, we'll be uh, sending out feedback forms. Uh, we'll be really grateful if you could uh, spare a couple of minutes to fill the forms. Um, that will be really good. Um, thank you. Now I'll hand over to Dr. Yadava Jeve for his talk. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mr. Yadava Jeve. I'm a deputy clinical director at Women's Hospital and consultant in the fertility. I will just start sharing my screen and, the, and I will. Okay. So today I'm going to uh, start with the fertility and diet, and then the next talk would be the programming the future generation or generations, in fact. In the diet and fertility, we'll discuss what, what is the healthy eating before conception, how it helps for the achieving the natural conception, and then the programming future generations, how exactly this epigenetic changes or the changes in the babies during the pregnancy and why it is important to follow the healthy diet, and which the theme would be continued by Hannah by discussing the diet in pregnancy. So introduction. Are you in, not able? Uh, sorry, are you not able to share your slides? Uh, we are. I am sharing slides. Sorry, I can't see them. Can uh, everyone see them? I, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, we'll just go back. For reminding me, I thought I have clicked the share button. Yeah. So as 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 can I was saying that we are sorry. Can you enlarge the slides, please? Yeah. So we we are going to discuss on the diet and fertility with programming the future generations. As I was discussing that how common or how prevalent the common uh, the the sufferability is. One in seven couple find it challenging to achieve a pregnancy, and it is on rise due to various reasons and it does affect the mental and the physical well-being of the couples. But when we investigate these couples, we find actually 25% of time it is unexplained. What does unexplained means? Unexplained means we can't find a, a problem in sperms, can't find problem in eggs or womb or the tubes. So that means all the fertility investigations come back or test as normal. Then those, those cases, we say it's unexplained. Either we go with assisted conception or the treatment. But in fact, is there something that could be done to optimize the health, to make the 
couple's health better to achieve the natural pregnancy? Answer to that is absolutely yes. We have seen many success stories. And that's why it is very important to have the diet and lifestyle changes for the couples who are trying to achieve a pregnancy. The same thing has been said in the NICE guideline. NICE is an organization which, control, which guides all medical practice in the UK. When couples start trying for pregnancy, they go on internet, they find various things, uh, some few dietary advices are extreme, few are common sense based, and that, that's why it is very important to discuss that what is really a fertility diet, what is evidence based, and what helps to achieve the natural pregnancy. Sometimes couples do ask me that really what we eat can can it affect our chances of getting pregnant? And when we looked into the evidence, there has been few studies and there is strong evidence. Those studies have showed that healthy preconception dietary pattern, both in men and women, not just in women, have been shown the effect, beneficial effect on the fertility. So I talked about an excellent subfertility, but even we have some investigation showing mild sperm problem, mild egg problems. Those could be corrected with the diet. So the fertility diet comprises a plan of proteins. Again, it's common sense. This is the same theme we are hearing in throughout this webinar series, uh, addressing different health problems. But coming back to, yes, vegetable sources um, of proteins, um, more monounsaturated fats. Uh, and they have shown that 66% um, uh, uh, increase the risk relate, uh, if, if, if the dietary pattern is not followed healthy, there is 66% increase in the risk of subfertility in the ovulatory, that means egg release pattern, or 27% uh, in, the, in, in, in the girls uh, with a non-egg release pattern. So let me explain you what this egg release and non-egg releasing pattern is. In, in, in the subfertility or, or the couple trying to conceive, there is a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, and it is closely associated with the problems with egg release, or what we call in medicine, ovulation. Those problems are common in the girls who has either obesity, polycystic ovarian disease, plus the, the dietary pattern, which will not particularly helpful for egg release, and those girls suffer more with the subfertility. And that's why, uh, we, we have seen that there is a 66% increase risk of the problem related to egg release in those couples. The study also find that, found that the ovulation pattern and gestational diabetes are largely preventable through the diet and lifestyle modifications. There is also a funding issue. Couples come for the fertility treatment and the NHS funding criteria is the BMI less than 30. So if the BMI is slightly even more than 30, like 31, 32, they do not get funding. Obviously, there are various other criteria for assisted conception funding as well, but the BMI is one of the important criteria. And the BMI criteria is also for men and women. And that underlines the importance of having the diet activities and, and the lifestyle before uh, or during trying for a conception. It's not just to optimize the success, it's also to be eligible for funding. And that's the whole idea, why there is a criteria in the funding. Because that's what the NHS says, if we could achieve the healthy weight, uh, there is a high chance of natural conception, and those couples most likely won't need a funding and assisted conception. Uh, nuts like flax seeds, uh, walnuts, so, I mean, again, the same thing, same thing, uh, theme I'm saying again and again, uh, that the healthy foodstuffs such as omega-3 fatty acids, folic acid, vitamin E, B vitamins, proteins, they have shown to improve the sperm and egg parameters. And they act as a raw material while development of these gametes. So the concept came as a fertility diet. <clears throat> if the folic acid intake is less, folic acid is important, for stopping baby having any congenital problems, any problems in the baby, such as neural tube defect. But not just that, it also helps 
to have the regular egg release because lack of it can cause sporadic convulsion. That's why from your general practitioner to your fertility specialist, everybody says that take the folic acid over the counter three months when you start thinking of trying for a conception. Saturated fat content has shown to lower the sperm concentration. So for men out there who had borderline semen analysis, uh, semen problems or sperm problems, they can very well improve the sperm parameters by changes in the diet and the lifestyle, such as exercise, stopping smoking, uh, limiting the caffeine intake. And as, as I have said in the next couple of sentence that limiting meats, cheese, uh, uh, and improve, increasing the low fat dairy diet and fish. Sorry, Adhava, can I interrupt? Your microphone is playing a bit. Can you just adjust your microphone, please? Sorry, uh, uh, is it okay now? It's better now, yes. Yeah, thank you. So the coming back fertility diet, uh, the, the point I was making earlier on the slides, which you might have read, uh, if you haven't heard, uh, the, the point I was making is the sperm parameters could be improved with diet, improvement in diet, lifestyle, stopping smoking, limiting caffeine intake. Now, going back to this next, uh, coming back to this uh, next slide, which is on, on, on your screen, low intake of trans fats is important. Increasing the monosaturated fats is important. Low intake of animal proteins with greater vegetable protein intake, high intake of high fiber, low glycemic carbohydrates, and greater preference for the dairy product for the girls. So this, this diet is explained for the girls. And this diet is from this NHS study, that's the nurse health study. So just to summarize what to eat and what not to eat, again, as I said, it's a common theme which we have seen again and again is having the plant-based diet, plant-based proteins, uh, vegetable um, oils, whole grains. They improve the fertility versus trans fats, animal proteins, um, excessive caffeine intake does not help for fertility. Soy protein, again, soybean contains natural phytoestrogen or natural estrogen, or we could say in simply plant estrogen. So that helps for the female fertility, but it hinders the male fertility because that's not good. And therefore it is very important to categorize in the fertility diet what is good for man and woman and obviously few common sense things are good for both there are, has been studies of high level of caffeine intake associated with sub fertility the antioxidants act to reduce the amount of reactive oxygen species just to simplify this concept we in our life we suffer with various stresses stress mental stress physical stress environmental stress as having pollution exposure to the, the to uh, and even eating certain foodstuffs can increase the what we call in medicine free oxygen radicals or these are the damaging substances they can damage the cells they can hasten the aging process they damage the eggs and sperms for clearing that we need counteractive substances such as what we call antioxidants and they are high in carotenes, uh, lycopene in tomatoes, uh, vitamin C, vitamin E. And these antioxidants help to clear those uh, damaging chemicals from the body and improve the sperm and egg parameter. Why it is very important in fertility as compared to other cells? Because the eggs and the sperms are rapidly dividing cells. Imagine millions of sperms are formed every day so it's like a conveyor belt so any insult can cause the problems in the production and the quality of the product quite similar with the eggs the egg which is released in a cycle is destined to be released almost two to three months before actual release so the development start two to three months before and any insult during that development process of that egg can cause the impact on the quality and this is why I couldn't stress enough the importance of diet, clearing these free oxygen radicals, 
and improving optimizing the fertility that improves not only the chance of natural conception but it also gives us better chances of success for anyone who needs treatment if you go online or different fertility clinics they have different um, charts or the different footsteps some are myths some are facts but as i said earlier that most of these things are the common sense approach the diet which is in general is healthy is healthy for fertility now that leads to the second part of my talk on the programming the future generations in in in, in our life we love to blame and we we obviously the, the, again the purpose of this is not to blame the my mom or or the mothers in general but it is to understand and emphasize the importance of how the fetal programming happens and how that impact the future and and decide the future disease pattern of an individual even there is a book on the mother blame game so coming back to this story how this concept started this gentleman called david becker he noticed that there is a odd correlation that poorest regions of england and wales were the one with the highest rate of heart disease i mean heart disease was and this was in 80s and before 80s and heart disease was supposedly at that time was always thought to be a disease of rich and affluence and this was a bit odd so he studied their history he was epidemiologist so he studied and he went into their birth records and he found that there is a link between the birth weight and the size and the and their disease pattern and that's why then he come up with the concept of fetal programming and that is called as barker's hypothesis at the, at the first it it wasn't accepted very well by the scientific community but when we looked into uh, when they looked into other areas um, and and the uh, in in uh, in other countries they found the quite similar pattern and this is where then it becomes a phenomena and it becomes it it, it became um, a very widely accepted concept that how this first 9 month of life shape the rest of our life and that is the fetal programming hypothesis of the diseases happens in future and the reason i'm I, i would like to touch on this topic because life is a continuum we we discussed on the sub fertility we discussed on how we optimize the chances of getting pregnant and once the pregnancy happens why it is important to continue that pattern because that dietary pattern is going to program the baby for its future life future adult life for decades to come and this chronic disease is attributed to this developmental origin and this list of this so you imagine any non communicable or non infectious disease they have some links related to this developmental origin hypothesis and this is why i have given this list but most commonly known diabetes Uh, obesity uh, hypertension heart diseases and as i said like this extensive list of these diseases that has been shown to have this developmental origins how it works so i uh, and my apologies for this busy slide but i just wanted to explain the concept that how the mother's development and growth or maternal malnutrition and when i use the word malnutrition it could be the overnutrition too or so, not sorry, take, I right sorry i got to interrupt again uh, the, uh, the voice is still not very clear can sorry you, uh, you can like, can you hear me no yeah it gets better and then uh, if you adjust your microphone then sorry sorry i think i think it's just the laptop how um, i adjust the microphone okay is it okay now yeah it's better thank you yeah thank you so coming back to um, i was just saying apologies for this busy slide but i was just uh, uh, here uh, I, i can explain the complexity of how the maternal malnutrition that could be undernutrition or that could be overnutrition not very clear sorry sorry is it clear now 
Mm. It gets clear and then again, uh, again, crackling noise comes. Uh, sorry, is it is it okay now? Mm, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm holding very still the microphone. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what's coming, how it works. Um, when there is a maternal hyperglycemia or, or, or high sugar levels in mom's blood, that sets the baby to use the less sugar because the sugar uh, can induce the response in the baby and the baby get adapted to the energy conservation mechanism. And when the baby is then enters in the adult life, the the setting in the baby's blood or the baby's genes are still with the energy conservation mechanism. That means it saves the energy. And then that leads to the obesity with quite similar amount of food. So it's like a vicious cycle. The fetal programming leads to the adulthood obesity and adulthood obesity leads to then the maternal obesity and malnutrition, which in turn, when those girls grow up, grow up and have their babies, then their babies are again programmed to quite similar type of epigenetic changes or the genetic changes. So this is a vicious cycle. And that's why, as I said, it is a programming, not only a future generation, but the future generations. And this is this is the concept the Barker's ex Barker has explained. And this is why we are stressing the importance of continuing with the healthy diet, not just before the pregnancy, but during the pregnancy, as that is going to program the baby for having a future disease or not having a future diseases, uh, such as diabetes, heart disease, obesity. The World Health Organization has said the same thing again. The global burden of death, disability, and loss of human capital as a result of impaired fetal development is huge and affects both developed as well as developing countries. And that's the problem across the globe. Therefore, to conclude, prevention of any disease is a cornerstone, not just of fertility, but also the future diseases. And this is how the perinatal health is important and diet in the perinatal phase is important. Um, and we, we must understand these complexities and identify the right or, or to choose the right type of diet, not only to achieve the pregnancy, but also to program the baby for future life. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yadava. I've got a few questions for you. Um, the fertility diet mostly aligns with general healthy eating guidelines uh, other than full fat dairy. Why is full fat dairy favored over low fat varieties when it comes to optimizing fertility? Uh, it's, it's a good question. They have done in the studies and they have seen in... Uh, it's, it's, it's mainly related to vitamin D as well. And um, and it is mainly for the girls, as I said. In the boys, we have said that low dairy fat, then, um, uh, but fertility diet is coming from the NHS too. So they have um, categorized that, that type of diet. Okay. What are your thoughts on antioxidant supplements for fertility or do you recommend a food first approach? It's a good question. So, the question that clear, whether yeah, we will. Can you just check? Sorry. Is that okay? Yeah, it's a bit better. Hello. Yeah. So, the point I was making is shall we take the vitamin C pill or shall we recommend having a orange instead? Obviously, you have the orange, and it is about how the dietary changes as well to going with the supplements or the supplements don't help to optimize the weight and don't have other benefits that what the clay offer. So I would still keep supplements if your intake of polycacid is not 
adequate and it's not adequate to meet the current demand, then I would advise to have the policy assessment and solar advisor cabinet. Yeah. For the boys who got lactose intolerance, what is recommended instead of soy milk? Okay, I mean, again, um, it's not like uh, the, the, the dairy or, or that particular food is... is, is Can't not hear you. Too... Sorry. Maybe put it in chat. So, yeah. Can we just go to now and then I will come back with uh, with the answers again? Yeah, that's fine. We'll start Hannah's presentation and then we'll come back to the answers to your questions. Thank you. Okay, Hannah, uh, I'll hand over to you to start your presentation. Okay, let me just bring up my... <laughs> Can you see that okay? Uh, I'm yes. going to bring it onto the full. Oh, there yes. we go. <clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Hannah Jones. I'm a senior community dietitian. I've been working in Birmingham Community Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust since 2009. Uh, I was for five years working on a scheme in Birmingham called Maternal Lighten Up. Some of you may remember it. It was a public health program. Currently, I do general clinics, a specialist weight management clinic, and I also work with the women's hospital. We do work with them on gestational diabetes. So I'm just going to go through <clears throat> what we recommend for diet in pregnancy. And um, first of all, gonna have a quick look at why this is important what we mean by health eating in pregnancy, pregnancy supplements, a little bit about some pregnancy conditions and how diet can help, food safety in pregnancy, putting on a healthy baby weight, and just briefly, diet when you're breastfeeding. So. Oop, right. So as uh, we've just heard, you are what your mother eats. <laughs> and there's been a lot of work now, as uh, we've heard about this uh, epigenetic programming at a cellular level <clears throat> in children. Um, and it continues, uh, it's very interesting. It's this first 1000 days concept from the start of pregnancy, which is about the first 270 days until the child is two years old. So it's now recognizes this critical window of growth and development. It can affect your health across the lifespan, but it's not just diet. You've got other factors, you know, hormones, stress, environmental things such as pollution. So we're not 100% in control of all of this, but nutrition is an important part. And so for a lot of women, <clears throat> having a baby is a good time to think about what you're eating overall. Um, it will help your baby have a good start in life and it supports your own health as the mother and different nutrients have different roles for your baby. Now, as I said, this is sort of mostly advice for all pregnant women, but you, you might need further support if you've got a diet related condition. So please ask your GP or midwife to refer you to a maternal dietitian. And as I said before, good nutrition is very important, but there are so many other things that can affect your pregnancy, some of which you might have very little control over. Social factors, economic factors, lifestyle generally. Again, there is support available for these areas. So asking your midwife or GP for help if needed. But we recognize that, you know, sometimes people just have to do the best they can. You know, that's life. So what is health eating in pregnancy? So it doesn't mean going on a really special diet. It is basic healthy eating advice, which I'll come on to. And there's no need to eat for two, unfortunately. Sorry about that. A lot of people get very excited. You can eat a lot more 
we really only recommend an extra 200 calories a day from week 28 onwards. That's coming up to your third trimester. So it does mean we like you to eat regularly and to eat healthily. Eating regularly means having around three meals a day and two to three healthy snacks a day. We don't recommend leaving it longer than about three or four hours eating in the day and try and not leave it longer than 12 hours maximum. So the overnight fast can be challenging for some people, especially if you don't eat breakfast routinely. But when you're pregnant, we do try to encourage you to have a something, some kind of a snack to get the day started. Oh, I don't know what that's. that's a... Can you still see my slides or have I disappeared off somewhere? Yes, yes, we can see your slides. Oh, right. My screen did a weird thing then. OK, fine. I'll carry on. OK, um, so eating healthily is using, basing your diet on the Eat Well Guide. Um, the Eat Well Guide is the recommended advice for us all generally. Um, so it's not really moving away from that. I'm going to sort of highlight certain particular areas. Most of us, for one reason or another, might not be following this because, as we know, life, you know, we tend to get diverted with other types of food. But this is where we're going to start to try and achieve a balance of nutrients. So looking at it individually, as you can see, we've got the yellow section, which is the starchy carbohydrates. So that's your potatoes, bread, rice, pasta and other starchy carbohydrates like cereals, yam, chapatis trying to include some of this food at every meal because it's giving you energy and the baby energy, uh, fiber if you choose the whole grain variety and B vitamins. So try and choose whole grain or higher fiber options as much as possible. And it will give you and the baby energy and it can help with morning sickness. As these foods, they break down in your body to release something called glucose which when that goes into your blood, your blood glucose levels, if you're low in your blood glucose levels, your morning sickness can be worse. So these are some of the foods that might help with that. Fruit and vegetables, as we know, we all want to be eating five a day minimum. More than that is great. Uh, we like you to choose different colors because all the pigmentation in the skins of the, uh, the fruit and vegetables give you different micronutrients. So these will give you vitamins and minerals, fiber, and some fluid. So <clears throat> fresh, frozen, tinned, dried, and juiced all count. A portion is a handful, roughly, cupped handful. Um, and pure fruit juice in is included, but only one a day. Oh, I missed off counts once, it should say, at the end there. This section is your proteins, so beans, pulses, fish, eggs, meat, and other proteins like nuts, corn, and tofu. When you're pregnant, we like you to have around two to three portions of these a day. So basically two to three meals a day having some protein. And oily fish uh, about once to twice a week. And I'll come back to that in a minute, why that's important. A portion of this is around two eggs or about three tablespoons of pulses, if you're having those sort of food, or <clears throat> a palm size, roughly, of meat or fish. That's a portion. And protein is used for growth. So super important in pregnancy for your baby's overall growth. And it's also used for repair. So the mother needs it as well. So in this group, we've actually got quite a lot of interesting micronutrients. We've got iron. In most of these foods, it helps prevent anemia and also can help with a baby's brain development. There's B12. Vitamin B12 is also important for brain development in the baby and for preventing neural tube defects. If you're vegetarian or vegan, you will have to consider this because B12 is found in animal food. So animal products. So you'll need to either look at for, if the food's been fortified with B12 or 
consider taking a vitamin supplement. Iodine, this is an interesting nutrient that's going to grow in uh, media coverage. Um, there's a lot of work going on with iodine. It's found in uh, the diet in the UK, mostly in fish, particularly white fish, and in dairy foods, which I'll mention again in a minute. It helps with the baby's brain development. And we're currently seeing suboptimal levels of iodine in the UK population because a lot of people don't eat enough fish or dairy food. So you may need to consider a supplement in pregnancy. We'd recommend 150 micrograms a day max because it is also involved with iodine is what's to, um, uh, is used by the thyroid. And <clears throat> you don't want to over uh, have too high amount of iodine because it can affect your thyroid negatively. So we just need the right amount of iodine. Anybody with a pre-existing thyroid condition needs to discuss their iodine requirements with a GP or a maternal dietitian. And finally, in this group, you also find omega-3s. Now, we're looking for omega-3s called EPA and DHA, which are found in oily fish. And they're good for baby's brain development, for their eyes and their nervous system. Now, there's another type of omega-3, uh, which was already mentioned uh, in the previous uh, presentation, which is alpha-linolenic acid, which is ALA. And a lot of people who are vegetarian or vegan will be looking at <clears throat> taking foods rich in ALA omega-3. It doesn't convert as well in the body to these types of omega-3. So you may want to consider a supplement. There is an algae-based supplement, which has this EPA and DHA omega-3 in it, which is useful for vegan and vegetarian people. <clears throat> Moving on. We've got the dairy section. We try, we would recommend having three portions a day here. A portion is about a glass of milk, a 150 gram pot of yogurt, or a small 30 gram piece of cheese. This would give you enough calcium, which is what we're looking for in this food group. Choose low fat versions here, unless you're underweight at the start of your pregnancy. So the micronutrients in this group, we've got calcium, and this is a mineral which helps build teeth and bones, and it's useful for that purpose for the baby and for you. If you have non-dairy milks, yogurts and cheese, check that calcium and iodine has been added in the ingredients list. They, they do add it, you just need to double check that it's in the one you're having. There are other non-dairy sources of foods that have some calcium, uh, tahini paste, dal, spinach, broccoli, kale, okra is actually quite rich, enriched tofu, beans, sardines, or little fish that you eat the bones as well, uh, oranges, orange juice, almonds, and dried fruit. And again, in this group, we also find iodine as mentioned before. So this helps with the baby's brain development. Oils and spreads. Uh, we want to choose unsaturated oils and low fat spreads. Um, unsaturated fats are heart healthy fats, as we call them. And these include your vegetable oils, rapeseed oil and olive oil and sunflower oils. But all fats are high in energy, high in calories, and so need to be eaten sparingly. And finally, in the food section, we've got what are, we tend to term your extra foods. So these are your foods high in fat and sugars, cakes, biscuits, sweets, crisps, sugary drinks, butter and ghee and ice cream. And trying to eat less often and in smaller amounts to put, avoid putting on too much weight during pregnancy. In the second and third trimesters, there is an increase usually of insulin resistance, which can lead to an increase in blood glucose levels. And these 
types of foods, these extra foods contain a lot of glucose. And this can cause a problem. You could be diagnosed with gestational diabetes as a result. So it's best to avoid these foods as much as possible for that reason. And fluid, super important. Um, water, fruit teas, skimmed or semi-skimmed milk, uh, one glass of fresh juice a day, or sugar-free drinks. So we'd say have about eight drinks a day. I've crossed out the six because the standard advice is six to eight, but in pregnancy, you need to be having around 1900 mils a day. Um, try to drink more if you're being sick. If it's hard to just take sips constantly rather than one large glass at one go, drink more if you're doing exercise. Nausea will be worse if you're dehydrated. So as we know, this is a big problem, especially in the early part of pregnancy. And your baby is basically living in a watery world inside you. There's in the amniotic fluid. So you want to keep that fluid topped up. In pregnancy, we do need to take two nutrients in a supplement form. And this is because it's been, there's a higher requirement in pregnancy and it's quite hard to get enough from food. So the two main vitamin supplements are folic acid and vitamin D. People, you know, if you're following a vegetarian or plant-based diet, as I mentioned earlier, you may want to take additional supplements of iodine, omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin B12. And there is a British Dietetic Association food fact sheet on plant-based diets, which can refresh you on uh, any nutrients that may need supplementation. So folic acid, um, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, is a synthetic form of vitamin B9. It can help reduce the risk of your baby developing neural tube defects. And we recommend taking 400 micrograms a day from your pregnancy planning. So as soon as you stop contraception or you're trying for a baby until week 12 of your pregnancy. Some people may need to take a higher dose of folic acid and that's five milligrams a day. So it's quite significantly higher. And a doctor has to prescribe this higher dose. So the 400 micrograms a day dose, the lower dose you can buy in shops, but the five milligrams a day you'd have to have prescribed. And you'll need this if you have had a previous pregnancy affected by a neural tube defect, you or your partner have a neural tube defect, you are taking certain medications for epilepsy, you've got celiac disease or diabetes, uh, if your BMI is over 30 and if you have sickle cell anemia or thalassemia, you'll also need this higher dose. There is the folate is the, what we would say call the natural form of vitamin B9 that you find in food. So the sources of folate in your diet are mostly your dark green leafy vegetables. So your spinach, kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage and broccoli. You find it in pulses beans and legumes, so pulses and peas, yeast and beef extracts, so I think marmite, <laughs> and I should say bovril as well, to be fair, <laughs> oranges and orange juice, wheat bran and other whole grain foods, poultry and pork, and some foods are fortified with folate. The other pregnancy supplement that we say you should take for absolutely is vitamin D and it helps to absorb calcium uh, from the gut into the body and it is important for your bone health and um, there's been a big move long standing in Birmingham now to uh, reinforce this need for vitamin D because they were seeing an emergence of rickets in Birmingham Rickets is when the bones are too soft. And when the child learns to walk, they become a bow legged shape to the body. So um, taking vitamin D in pregnancy 
And then for the child to be taking vitamin D when they're young will help to prevent that. Your main source of vitamin D is sunlight. Uh, the sun UVB light activates um, the fat cells under the skin that starts the chemical reaction to create vitamin D. And it's this type of sunlight in this country from March to October. The rest of the year, it's too weak. And we're lucky to see it, enough of it, March to October. So um, there's also limited vitamin D in food sources egg yolks, you find some fortified foods. So if you look on the back of packs, breakfast cereals, margarine, some fruit juices, some non-dairy milks and yogurts, mushrooms and oily fish. Um, the one thing we say is don't take a fish liver oil or eat liver in pregnancy, even though it does have vitamin D, it also contains high levels of vitamin A and we don't want high levels of vitamin A in pregnancy. I'll come back to that in a minute. So in pregnancy, we recommend a supplement of 10 micrograms of vitamin D every day throughout your pregnancy and when you're breastfeeding. If you're at a higher risk of vitamin D deficiency, uh, maybe due to increased skin pigmentation, reduced exposure to sunlight for whatever reason, um, your BMI is over 30, um, you will need to take 25 micrograms a day. So in Birmingham, the quickest way to take folic acid and vitamin D are in the Healthy Start vitamins. Healthy Start vitamins are free for all pregnant women with a registered with a Birmingham GP. Um, they're available from the start of pregnancy until your child is 12 months old. And you can get them from midwives, health visiting teams and some health centers, children's centers and some pharmacies. And uh, there is actually, if you do a search, find Healthy Start Vitamin Services, uh, it'll bring up a web page where you can also do a local search. You may wish to take a more broad supplement, multivitamin and mineral supplement. This may be if you're unable to eat the range of nutrients recommended in pregnancy, it could be if you're experiencing a lot of nausea and sickness. Uh, so if you do, uh, always take the recommended dose of that supplement. Higher levels could cause harm to you and your baby. And you need to make sure it's a pregnancy multivitamin. So general multivitamins from the supermarket contain vitamin A in the form of retinol. And it's high levels of this can cause harm to your baby. So we don't recommend that. You should be getting enough vitamin A just from your food. So in pregnancy, we get all these lovely conditions that can also affect your food and how your body is behaving. One of the most famous ones is constipation. And it's very common during pregnancy. It's linked with the hormone progesterone, which increases in pregnancy. And this makes your body's muscles relax. And your intestines are also a muscle. So they're relaxing. And this is in the run up to delivering a baby. So everything's relaxing. But it means your intestines tend to slow down. They're not pushing the food through as rapidly. And slower digestion can lead to constipation. So what we'd recommend is having plenty of fiber, wholemeal and granary bread type fibers, high fiber breakfast cereals, lots of fruit and vegetables, especially trying to eat the edible skins of those. Uh, you could try prunes or prune juice, drinking plenty of fluid and getting active. So in your gut, it's like a tube and uh, the muscle on the outside of the tube is squeezing the food through. It needs something to work on. So you need plenty of fiber, which isn't digested and absorbed into the body. It passes through into the large intestine. So it gives uh, some bulk and the fluid makes it soft. So together, that's why you can possibly improve constipation. The other common uh, pregnancy condition is nausea and sickness. Again, it's linked with your pregnancy hormones. 
Um, strategies can be eating and drinking little, but often. Trying to prevent dehydration by drinking little, but often. Some people find ginger rich foods and drinks help. Eating very dry, starchy carbohydrates can help. So avoiding anything with fat in, sometimes even protein foods are very hard to tolerate. So dry toast, dry crackers, it's obviously coming far away from all that healthy eating that I've mentioned before, but we understand that the nausea and sickness is very powerful. So just trying to get something in to the body during those weeks. <clears throat> Acupressure may be helpful for some people. So there is a pressure point on the wrist, which can sometimes reduce sickness. In about 90% of pregnancies, sickness should resolve by about 20 weeks. But if your vomiting is severe, and it could be this condition called hyperemesis gravidarium, I think it's called, um, and you're unable to keep any food or water down, you do need to get medical help. So what they will do in that case is you will probably have IV fluids to rehydrate you. And heartburn. This tends to come on particularly in the second half usually of the pregnancy and it's combined with the softening of the muscles again. So there is a little muscle between the bottom of your throat and the top of the stomach and it's a tight little what we call a sphincter which um, will stop the stomach acid leaking back up your throat. But in, in pregnancy this will relax and so you might start to get a little bit of that stomach acid starting to leak back up and combined with the growing baby pressure coming up from underneath pushing up so heartburn is a very common pregnancy condition again small regular meals and snacks not overfilling your stomach eating slowly so it's really well chewed food drinking fluid between your meals but not at your meal time because if you have it at your meal time you'll just create a lot of fluid sitting in your stomach uh, reducing caffeine avoiding fatty fried and spicy food and then there's the mechanics of sitting up straight when you eat, don't eat late at night, trying to not lie down right after eating. And some people find propping themselves up in bed will help. Uh, food safety in pregnancy. Now in pregnancy, our own immune system, the mother's immune system um, will be reduced. And so there's a combination of uh, bacteria and things that we may find in our food that normally our immune system can fight off. And obviously the baby's immune system is very underdeveloped. So we have to be careful with foodborne bacterias that normally we probably don't notice, but in pregnancy, we have to be a little bit more careful. So the first one is salmonella. We recommend you avoid raw shellfish, raw and undercooked meats, unpasteurized milk, raw or undercooked eggs without the lion code. Now, as you'll see on the next column at the bottom, in the UK, there are many eggs you might see now in the supermarket with a lion stamped onto the egg. These have been deemed safe to eat raw or lightly cooked, including for pregnant women, but only the eggs with the lion code stamped on. Other food safety things such as always washing your hands after handling raw meats, store rude, raw foods separately from cooked foods. Um, going back to eggs, processed ice cream made with pasteurized milk and eggs should be safe. Then we've got listeria. Uh, so you find this on soft ripened cheeses like brie or camembert and some goat's cheese. So we'd avoid those. And we avoid soft blue vein cheeses like Danish blue. All unpasteurized dairy products, all types of pate, including vegetarian pate and soft serve ice cream from vans or kiosks. Be careful, make sure your takeaway food or your cooked chill food are really heated through and piping hot in the middle. Chill food should be stored at the correct temperature below five degrees C and don't eat foods after they're used by date. There is another lovely bacteria called toxoplasmosis. This you find on raw and undercooked meat, 
raw cured meats such as parma ham or salami although those foods salami can be eaten if it's cooked so if it's on a pizza that's okay unwashed vegetables and fruit cat feces or soil contaminated with cat feces so if you own a cat you have to be careful handling if you have a cat litter what you do some people wear gloves or get other people to do it unpasteurized goat's milk and dairy products uh, now in fish we know that there are contaminants uh, like mercury and dioxins they're called and uh, they get stored in the flesh of oily fish. Shark, marlin and swordfish, not commonly eaten, but still we'd say to avoid because they're what they're called higher order fish, they will have stored a lot of that uh, mercury and dioxins. So even though oily fish like tuna, salmon, mackerel, sardines are good for you because they have this omega-3, we would say limit that to no more than twice a week to avoid overload with these other things like mercury and dioxins. And tin tuna, we recommend maximum four cans a week, maximum four medium cans a week. Vitamin A. So we said about avoiding multivitamins with vitamin A. Fish liver oils, avoid and avoid liver and avoid liver products. Caffeine, one of the most well-known uh, things to avoid, or be careful with in pregnancy. So there's a lot of evidence now that shows that high intakes of caffeine can increase risk of miscarriage. So we limit caffeine to 200 milligrams a day. And listed there are the rough amounts of caffeine in various products. Obviously, it depends, say, with your coffee or tea, how strong you like it. So be very careful, especially buying coffees and teas from cafes and when you're not making them at home, you know, you, you won't know how much caffeine's in there. So be careful, very cautious with this. Uh, alcohol, the recommendation now is to completely avoid alcohol in pregnancy. There is a known link with something called fetal alcohol syndrome in the baby. And we don't know at what level in what which women that that will be a problem. So if you've got any concerns about alcohol consumption, best to speak to your midwife about this. So quickly, we're going to talk about putting on a healthy baby weight. There are no UK guidelines for how much to put on in pregnancy by way of weight. We do sometimes refer to the USA guidelines, the, the Institute, of, uh, the IOM guidelines. And so what we'd use is when you go to your first booking appointment with your midwife, they'll do your height and weight and create a BMI measurement. So using that measurement will give you a rough guide then how much weight to put on over the course of the pregnancy. So you can see there when you are have a lower BMI, you may need to put on more weight. And obviously, as you get to a higher BMI, you would probably then be aiming to just put on the baby weight itself, which is the weight of the baby and any extra fluids to do with pregnancy. We definitely don't recommend dieting in pregnancy or actively trying to lose weight while you're pregnant. Uh, there is some evidence that that could cause a problem to the baby. Um, and it's equally important not to put on too much weight. So it's trying to follow that healthy eating advice to just put on a nice steady weight. Again, if you've got any concerns, there are maternal dietitians who can help support with that. And finally, breastfeeding and diet. There isn't much different. Um, it is basically healthy eating again. Still trying to have oily fish twice a week for the omega-3s. Drinking plenty of fluids. Very important when you're breastfeeding. You are creating milk, so you do need a lot of fluid for that. Continue to take a supplement of vitamin D. You may Again, wish to take, there are available breastfeeding multivitamins and mineral supplements. If you feel for whatever reason, you're not getting a range of nutrients from your food. Limiting caffeine, because it can pass through the breast milk and it might keep your baby awake and restless. Limiting alcohol, because again, it will pass through your breast milk. And talking to your midwife, health visitor, pharmacist or GP about any 
medications you're taking, some of which can pass through your breast milk. Uh, just to finish, I've mentioned the Healthy Start vitamins, which are free for all pregnant women. There is also the Healthy Start voucher scheme. You have to uh, qualify for this, but if you do, you can get vouchers worth £4.25 currently to spend on milk, fresh fruit and vegetables, plain frozen fruit and veg and infant formula. So you'd have to go uh, ask your health visitor or midwife and or you can go and access the website to apply. And that is about it. We have a list of resources here. So the British Dietetic Association do produce a range of what they call food fact sheets. And we've got a range there, pregnancy, breastfeeding, vegetarian and plant-based diets. There's also the NHS UK, healthy diet and pregnancy, and there's further advice on there. And that's it. Thank you, Hannah. That was really good presentation. Um, we have got a question for you, if you can answer quickly. Yeah. Um, is whole milk, whole milk is recommended for pre-pregnancy and skimmed uh, for pregnant women? That's a question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, you or yeah, the wine. You might, well, generally what we base the um, advice around milk on is a weight gain. Um, so sometimes i mean i'm i haven't looked at that uh, study in detail actually i need to have a look at the one that was mentioned earlier um my guess would be that uh, for some women they're not having enough fats to create hormones because there is a link between good quality fats and hormone production so i guess with the subfertility that's where that would come in uh but during pregnancy we would recommend skimmed or semi-skimmed for weight maintenance or weight management sorry in pregnancy unless you're underweight if you're underweight when you're having you know when you when you start your pregnancy we'd recommend whole milk then i hope that answers that question <laughs> are sweeteners allowed for diabetic pregnant women they are yes yep okay so when you say snacks only the healthy group foods Yes, um, what we tend to recommend with snacks would be um, fruit uh, or what we would call, I think it was mentioned previously, the low glycemic index, which um, if you Google low GI or low glycemic index, it will bring up a whole raft of information. But in that category, we'd have things like uh, nuts or a little bit of cheese. With So probably including a little bit of protein in a snack. Um, not relying on too much of the sugary snacks, um, although they're not banned. I mean, you're allowed to have a biscuit now. <laughs> it's just um, trying to include more nutrient rich food as snacks. Yeah. Can we drink red wine when pregnant? Right. So the advice with alcohol is to avoid completely. And the basis for that is that. <sighs> It was for a long time in this country seen as okay to have moderate, very small amounts of alcohol. However, the, the thinking now is that we don't know the threshold at which alcohol starts to cause a problem for each individual woman. And mild fetal alcohol syndrome can occur even with very small amounts of alcohol. And this will affect your child's uh, neurological de development and brain development. So we would definitely try and say, please stop all alcohol in pregnancy and save it for when the baby's born. <laughs> uh, it's maybe for you, uh, Yadava or Hana, any of you can answer. Is it safe to consume coffee while planning to get pregnant? I think, again, that was, a, was coffee listed earlier. I was just having it. Yeah, yes, I think it was mentioned increased caffeine is associated with subfertility. Yeah. Um, and I would agree, I would say that um, maybe one cup of coffee a day isn't going to be the end of the world, or maybe even two cups of tea a day isn't going to be the end of the world. But I think if you're having high levels of caffeine, I would definitely look at that and, um, you know, reduce significantly. Yeah. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Yadava. Um, that was really good um, session.
um yeah uh, we'll be sending the feedback link uh, for the feedback uh, please take a couple of minutes to fill the feedback uh, the next week sessions is on uh, diet and mental health uh, which is uh, um, on in which we are covering emotional eating and uh, eating disorders um and uh, that will be interesting presentation um, because lots of things have changed over the pandemic um, and uh, mental health is affecting people's uh, eating uh, behaviors uh, so please register with the event right um, thank you everyone for joining us today so we'll we'll close the session now thanks <laughs>